of them have a conference on nature-based approaches in urban areas. Yesterday was an extremely exciting day where we all learned a lot, and there's tons more to learn today. So um, before we start, I do want to offer an acknowledgement to Massachusetts and other tribes. The Stone Living Lab conducts research and educational programs in Boston Harbor, the islands, and the land along its shores. We recognize these lands, including where we are gathered today for this conference, for the unceded and still occupied homelands of the Massachusetts tribe. The Massachusetts people have lived here continuously for over 10,000 years, long before Europeans stole and colonized the land. Colonization brought the forced, brought the forced displacement of the Massachusetts, as well as mismanagement and unstable practices that scarred the land, water, and air. It is essential to acknowledge this truth and the terrible injustices European colonists committed against the land, water, indigenous people of not only the Massachusetts tribe, but all tribes. The complex legacy of colonization is continually felt today. The Stone Living Lab takes seriously its responsibility to respect people, flora and fauna, and the natural spaces, and incorporate traditional indigenous ecological knowledge into the climate resilient work we do. We've begun on this journey in partnership with the members of the Massachusetts tribe. We have a long way to go. Decolonization is an iterative and long-term journey. We have gathered this conference today, today to collectively learn from one another and to find ways to create resilience against rising waters and hotter temperatures that have already arrived and will never really continue to increase in frequency and severity. Although, although we must do a lot of learning, we must also remember that Massachusetts, as well as other tribes and peoples, has a standard of vocabulary with the land, water, and the air, and other non-human relatives for thousands of centuries before colonization. There has not been a time when people have not impacted the land they live on. Our choice is whether we live in reciprocity with our citizens and people, or continue the extractive actions that have still contributed to the changed climate we see today. We must continue to talk honestly and openly and often about how to collaboratively work towards repairing the harm that has been done by engaging these communities most impacted and co-creating solutions that incorporate the lessons we've forgotten. So thank you very much, and I want, and I want to pass it over to Brittany Knotts, Stone Living Labs Communication Manager and Conference Co-Chair. All right, thank you so much, Paula. We appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for being here today for day two of our first in-person conference. Um, my name is Brittany Knotts. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the communications manager and conference co-chair for the Stone Living Lab. Um, a few housekeeping items before we really get into things. If you've not yet signed up for field trips, please do so as soon as possible. Um, we did send an email out with links to all of those event rights for you to sign up if you need any assistance just come talk to conference staff. Um, and that includes tonight's Blenders and Bloopers dinner at Dorchester Brewing, which is gonna be a real fun time. Um, our conference planning committee has tried to keep this event as accessible and sustainable as possible. There are gender neutral restrooms on both the third and second floor of the campus center where we are now. Um, and if you need help finding those, please let us know. Um, there's also the workspace and Zoom room on the second floor, which is room 2545. Uh, it's on your campus center map. Um, if you need to go get some work done or space to just take a meeting or call. Um, <clears throat> on the sustainability front, we opted to use native plants that will be planted locally and on the Boston Harbor Islands up on our stage here. Um, all breakfasts and lunches are vegetarian and will be served in washable, reusable containers, generously provided by one of our sustainability sponsors, Useful. Please make sure to leave those containers here and do not take them home with you, even though they are really awesome and need to take them with you. <laughs> Please return um, those name tags so that we can get them back to our partners at Boston Harbor now for use at other events in the future. 
Um, the print program that you have includes very select conference information to cut down on paper usage, and is full. Of, and a full list of abstracts and authors can be accessed in a digital form on the conference webpage. Shuttle bus service will be provided to all off-site uh, field trips and events in an effort to uh, promote carpooling as well. <coughs> We are so grateful to everyone who's helped to make this conference possible. Um, a special thank you to our conference sponsors for their very generous support. The James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Foundation, the Cabot Corporation Foundation, the Barr Foundation, the Trustees of Reservations, Fusk and O'Neill, Dentraline, Weston and Sampson, the Nature Conservancy, AECOM, UMass Boston, and Useful. Thank you also to our incredible conference volunteers and everyone who was speaking today and yesterday. Um, we, could, we truly couldn't have done this without you. Um, to the wonderful UMass Boston event services crew, including John and Stephen from the events team, as well as Ernest and the rest of the Sodexo team, we are so grateful for you, for your help, and for making us feel so beautiful. <laughs> Kristen Uterick, Allison Novelli, Marianne Connolly, Shannon Hogan, and our interns, um, E. Jen Lee and Sarah Hope, as well as our managing director, Joe Christo. Thank you so much for all of the support that you've given us throughout this entire process. Um, to the Stone Living Lab Conference Committee, that's Jocelyn Alemu, Mark Borelli, Bob Chen, Paul Kirshen, Andrew McQueen, Daniel Perry, Rebecca Shore, and our event coordinator, Laura Sapphire, Sapphire Events. Last but certainly not least, to our conference chair and fearless leader, Melanie Garate. Um, whose last day is actually tomorrow. <laughs> For those of you who have not heard the news, um, Mel, it's been such an absolute honor and privilege to get to work with you. Um, and I am just in awe of what we were able to accomplish in just over eight months. <laughs> And I also want to point out that this room is full of so many extraordinary women in STEM, um, yourself included, and I really think that's a testament to your commitment to equity, and I thank you for never backing down on that. Um, <laughs> um, thank you for your grace under pressure, your guidance, your generally lovely aura, and of course, your mutual Pedro Pascal obsession. Um, <laughs> We are going to miss you so much, Mel, and uh, we wish you the best in your next adventure with the Consensus Building Institute, including the big move to Chile next year. We'll just pass this well. Okay, and without further ado, <laughs> I would like to introduce another remarkable female leader, Kathy Abbott, President and CEO of Boston Harbor Now. Kathy began her career uh, on the Boston Harbor Islands as a park ranger in college and has since served as Commissioner of the Department of Conservation and Recreation, Executive Director of the Tower Hill Botanic Garden, and Co-Chair of the City Parks Alliance. Thank you, Kathy, and welcome to the stage, wherever you are. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. What a conference. Holy smoke. Um, and it's so nice to see somebody in the back again today. Uh, and some new faces too. Uh, so I'm Kathy Abbott, President and CEO of Boston Harbor Now, and thrilled to be back here today. On behalf of Boston Harbor Now, the incredible team at UMass Boston, uh, who we are thrilled to work with as part of the Stone Living Lab, the City of Boston, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Executive Office of Energy and Environment, uh, and the National Park Service. So on behalf of the entire Stone Living Lab team, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Really, really glad you're all here because you are our um, audience. I'm excited to be here this morning because not only do I get to welcome you, I also get to uh, to thank Kathy Douglas Stone. Where's Kathy? Kathy Douglas Stone. Um, <laughs> we'll be hearing more later, I'm sure, but I have had the pleasure of uh, having Kathy as a friend and a mentor for many years. And Kathy is a wonderful woman who's Footsteps I try to follow in. She's somebody with a vision. She's somebody who's, who's bright, who's thoughtful, who cares, who's committed, and who invests in what she believes in. Uh, Kathy has brought us, was one of the founders of the Boston Harbor Islands National State Park, and 
we go to get the stone. And now we're still living well. I just learned from Alan Dossi that one of our conference attendees thought that the stone living well was called the stone living well because we work with, with uh, natural solutions uh, to stone. Um, and somebody had to explain that, well, no, uh, it, it's actually a stone is, is funded by the Stone Foundation. Which, interestingly enough, is connected to the Plymouth Rock Assurance Company. So we do have kind of a, a stone, rock, stone thing going on. Um, also, on this theme of sort of, you can never thank people too much, I also want to recognize Molly, who has been a phenomenal, phenomenal addition to Boston Health Now team, leader of the Stone Living Lab. You're going to miss you terribly. I think this conference is a phenomenal credit. Uh, to who you are, professionally and personally. So, yeah. <laughs> I also want to recognize Brittany and Rebecca, who I know are the women behind the woman. Uh, and have been working really hard uh, for everything that, that we've all been benefiting from uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, Thank you and good morning. That was much more 
formal than needs to be for my <laughs> brief introduction. I come to the podium both optimistic and with a great sense of urgency. My optimism is based on your presence here and yesterday and the presence of Climate Chief Melissa Hoffer, National Parks Director Chuck Sands, and Elder of the Massachusetts Tribe Elizabeth Solomon. That was a remarkable dialogue to set the stage for the first Stone Living Lab Conference, and we look forward to following in that tradition. My sense of urgency comes, and with this comes a little history of the lab. My sense of urgency comes because we know and hear every day about climate disasters, hurricanes, floods, tsunamis, heat waves, and forest fires. And as you know, they are only getting worse. Hurricane Eon, which struck the Caribbean and southern United States last September, was one of these recent disasters. The following month marked the 10th anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, which devastated New York City and New Jersey. And in the decade between these two storms were countless other events that were either directly attributable to climate change or worsened by it. Such events have caused the loss of many too many lives and had enormous impact on people, ecosystems, communities, and cities. In Boston, we also had two dramatic storms in the winter of 2018, both of which could have been much worse. Fortunately, no lives were lost during those events, but they did damage habitat and infrastructure. But they also brought renewed attention to the need for comprehensive and thorough climate resiliency planning, disaster preparedness, and innovation throughout the region. It was right after these Northeasters that we started thinking how we narrowly escaped disaster and how, from the experience of Super Storm Sandy, it was clear that nature and healthy ecosystems, resilient habitats, had provided invaluable protection to the coast and prevented even further loss. And in fact, in a conversation I had with the former head of the Park Service, who was the head of the Park Service during Superstorm Storm Sandy, he confirmed that it was the nature-based solution that had the most protective abilities during that terrible storm. The initial idea for the Stone Living Lab grew out of these two storms. Analysis showed that there were 30-foot waves in the Atlantic Ocean headed toward Boston. But by the time they reached the city shoreline, the waves were two feet, in part thanks to the mitigating effects of the Boston Harbor Islands. The islands had actually absorbed energy from the storms and demonstrated the power of natural systems for protecting our shore. From this came the lab we decided that we needed to expand our toolkit from the of possible solutions that we could use and bring together um, uh, uh, to solve the problems that we have been discussing. So the lab now is a partnership between UMass Boston, the city of Boston, the state, the National Park Service, um, Anybody who's anybody is part of it. <laughs> and over the next 12 months, we're going to focus on three principal projects. The first is research and monitoring of the success of couple burns across six sites along the coast with the support of a number of municipalities and, and the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management. The second is installing researching and monitoring living seawalls with our Australian colleagues at Living Seawalls and coupling that work with extensive community engagement. The third is partnering with the City of Boston to research innovative approaches to coastal flood protection along in vulnerable Boston neighborhoods. We will also 
continue to the excellent community work done by our education manager, who you know from yesterday, Rebecca Shore, and for decades here. <laughs> Experiments successful, experiments failed, it doesn't matter. It all comes out in education. As the lab wrote in a recent op-ed, climate change is a challenge that requires everyone at the table. Public partners at all levels of government, the private sector, scientists, and the residents in the communities who are at risk. This has always been the case. As long as I have been involved in environmental protection, the way we make progress is by working together in communities and bringing science, community engagement, and government together. And the audience that I see here and that was here yesterday can do that. And that is why, as I said in the beginning, I feel both urgency and optimism because we, we know that the waters will rise, that the glaciers are melting at greater rates on both poles, north and south, and that we in Boston are in fact going to be affected, and sooner than we are planning for. So with urgency, but optimism because of everyone in the room, I welcome you to the set first, the second day, first conference and stone living in <laughs> and look forward to working with all of you over many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for your past, present, and future support and leadership in the environmental world. The amazing group collected here is a testament to how important this work is to our communities. My name is Rebecca Shore. Uh, I am the Education and Engagement Program Manager here at the lab. And I apologize in advance for my allergy congestion. Um, pollen, as we all know, is also increasing due to climate change, so I would also like that to be introduced. <laughs> We're now very excited to introduce our three panelists, Joe Christo, Sheetal Shah, and Lauren Wayne, for a conversation about innovative work going on at three climate labs in Boston and New York City. The Stone Living Lab Partnership, the Trust for Governors Island Center for Climate Solutions, and the Urban Ocean Lab. But what are innovation labs, and what role do they play in accelerating climate action in coastal cities? So I'll introduce each of our panelists, and we'll get to hear a little bit more about their work uh, as they have a conversation. Joe Christo, of course, is our managing director here at the lab. Previous to his role at the lab, Joe served as the senior resilience and waterfront planner for the Boston Planning and Development Agency, and program director at the City of Boston's Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. Joe spent seven years working on community resilience projects for the city of New York, including leading environmental assessment operations for the city of New York Mayor's Office of Housing Recovery Operations following Hurricane Sandy. Sheetal Shah is the operations and engagement lead for the Urban Ocean Lab. Founded by Dr. Anna Elizabeth Johnson, Jean Flemma, and Marquis Stilwell, the Urban Ocean Lab is a think tank that cultivates rigorous, creative, equitable, and practical climate and ocean policy for the future of coastal cities. She tells a strategist and a researcher whose work is focused on exploring the intersection of global water risks, design, and climate policy. Prior to joining the Revision Lab, she tells helped launch ADO by MINI, a center for design research and programming in Brooklyn, New York. And finally, Lauren McRae is the director of climate programs for the Trust for Governors Island. The Trust is a 501c3 nonprofit organization created by the City of New York responsible for the planning, operations, and ongoing development of Governor's Island. The Trust Center for Climate Solutions will create a singular physical hub committed to researching and demonstrating urban climate solutions and advancing education, training, and workforce development opportunities for New Yorkers. Laura is an urban planner committed to serving the people and communities standing up to the climate crisis. She served as a senior policy advisor for the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice and Director of Resiliency Planning and Acquisition of the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. So with that, please help me welcome your speakers and our moderator, Kimberly Lucas. I often think about how many people it actually takes to move the ball. Uh, and that's what I think this panel is about. That's why I'm very excited 
to speak with these three folks here on the stage with me. Uh, because I think that the work around innovation and new ideas being brought into spaces where uh, Lauren and I were talking earlier, spaces where we may not have solutions yet, or we have to think of new solutions because old ones either don't work or aren't big enough or something, right? Take more than one person and one mind. Uh, and so, super excited to talk innovation and lab work. Uh, and the whole focus, I think, Rebecca mentioned this, is like, what is an innovation lab at all? Uh, and so, I'm just gonna open up this panel uh, by asking all of you, in your minds, what is innovation? What is the role of your respective labs uh, in this ecosystem? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I feel like Joe, you should go first. <laughs> no, no, you can go, please. <laughs> All right. So, thank you so much for having us here, um, both of us traveling to New York City for this, and felt like we've um, had such a warm welcome here at the conference. Um, we're very grateful to be partnering with Urban Ocean Lab and, and Still Lab on this, and hope that it's the beginning of much more to come. I want to evoke something that for those of you who were here yesterday, uh, Chuck Sands, uh, the third shared, which is the many times that you brought up experimentation and observation, and then experimentation again based on your observations. So when we think about what a lab is um, for Winters Island, um, it is just that, a place to come together to make observations, to experiment, and to practice in the field of study. For us, that field is climate change, climate impacts, climate adaptation, climate mitigation, and all of that leaning on the legacy of decades of work in environmental justice. But what is our place? Um, I'm curious if anyone has uh, been to Governor's Island in New York City, and it's okay if nobody in the audience raises your hand. Oh, okay, all right. So some of you know. There are some similarities to the Harbor Islands here in that we have a fort that's a national monument, Fort Jay, built in the late 1700s. Um, we have a camping or really a, a glamping operation, which I understand is also possible in the Harbor Islands, and um, a lot of kids, um, a lot of green space, and we at the Trust are there at least four, sometimes five or six days a week. Uh, keeping the park running and supporting day-to-day -day operations. And so that place for us is, you know, taking uh, the dark, you know, grimy, battery New York City subway or a bus um, out to the Battery Marine Terminal, which is uh, a cell phone story building, is waiting for a few minutes, you know, um, in that space, which is a historic one as well, that has some public art celebrating the history of our city. It's boarding a ferry that we inherited from the Coast Guard that carries both people and vehicles. Um, a fossil fuel gas guzzling machine we're not proud of and that we're replacing soon with a hybrid electric ferry. Um, and then arriving on this special place, a place that's car free, a place that has two miles of waterfront views, a place that has small piers that you can walk around on and really get close to the water, a place that has one of the city's first climate resilient design parks with hills that enabled um, our construction project on those hills to begin just two days after Hurricane Sandy. Um, sorry, to continue just two days after Hurricane Sandy. Um, we have you know, this experimental forest, we have 15 historic buildings, and our living lab is really leaning on this special place in the heart of New York Harbor and in full view of the city itself. The Statue of Liberty, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Financial District, Staten Island, and yes, New Jersey, which is my home state. And so, the Little Lab again for us is a place to use this island um, to invite all New Yorkers, folks from other cities, and people around the world to observe, experiment, and practice um, equitable climate solutions um, in, in the harbor. Thanks for that. Oh. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for that wonderful intro. So, um, Urban Ocean Lab, as you can guess from our name and you 
Movement from the back up, we um, create ocean climate policy solutions for coastal cities. Um, simply put, we focus on coastal cities because that's where the people are. We ran an analysis last year, and um, actually one of the fellows who contributed to that work is here in the audience, Alex Johnson. Um, we found in, in our analysis that 65 million people live in U.S. coastal cities. Um, and of that, almost 60% of that population identifies as black, indigenous, and people of color. So you have almost 20% of the U.S. population living in coastal cities who are exposed to the very unique set of coastal climate impacts that we've been talking about yesterday and we'll be talking about today. Um, so we work at that intersection of the climate of climate solutions, the ocean, and the cities to cultivate um, rigorous and equitable solutions. And we see innovation happening both internally in our lab in terms of how we are creating these solutions, and also innovation in cities. Um, cities are nimble, they're able to move faster than the state and federal level, um, and they're diverse places. So you have this density and diversity of populations, you have this space for innovation um, at, in government, and we are trying to harness that in developing um, climate solutions that can be both replicated in scale, so replicated across cities in the U.S., um, both coastal cities as well as uh, inland cities, but also scale to other uh, levels of government. So for us, innovation is happening at every level of work that we're doing. Um, and we are very much in our early years, and so being at conferences like this is also critical to the work that we're doing and helps inform the type of innovative policy solutions that we're looking to put forward. Hey everyone, um, I feel thankful to be up here with uh, such great colleagues and close friends as well. Um, I specifically asked one of them, Kim, not to make me cry on the panel. She started on that. Um, for a wonderful intro. Uh, <laughs> um, I really appreciate what you were saying, Lauren, and she as well. Um, and at the Snow Living Lab, you know, I think you've got a sense over the past couple of days. We're just so thankful for the, the many partners that, that really make this work happen, that, that we can't do it with, without that. It is core to our models, core to what we do. Um, it's partnership across organizations, but across people. Uh, it's what's brought this conference together. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, Boston, uh, like New York, is a, a really dynamic city where, you know, you have some of our uh, most uh, vulnerable to flooding neighborhoods right along the coast. And a mile inland, people who don't consider this a waterfront city right, have access to it. And really bridging that gap, you know, is, is really important to help bring us all together for sort of collective and collaborative approaches. That's what, you know, UMass Boston does. That's what Boston Harbor now does. You know, National Park Service, the city, the state, we're, we're working together to try to make sure that folks are coming at this with a similar urgency, as Kathy W. Stone mentioned, in approach. Um, and that's where the lab fills in the gaps. That's what the lab tries to do, is build those connections and help mobilize people with one another and use the uh, prototype and uh, you know, experimentation that Kim and I were fortunate enough to be able to do at the city of Boston um, and you know, learn from the lessons that Laura and I experienced in, in helping you know, uh, New York City recover from Hurricane Sandy and, and hopefully be able to take those and, and, and bring, help people imagine a future that we can't right now, which is what we saw in that panel yesterday. I mean, that indigenous knowledge fireside chat was just incredible. And, and really thinking about that observation and experimentation, we're so fortunate to have such wonderful researchers, you know, with our UMass Boston team and our research and monitoring community. You heard from a couple yesterday and with Mark Borelli and Francisco Perry, um, you know, and just trying to bring that work together in a way that is supported by the education, engagement, and policy work, too, to really try to imagine a new future together. Okay, so if I may translate. It seems like we have three different flavors of labs here. We have one focused a lot on education, experience, engagement, bringing people to, right? Like Lauren, you really took me from the subway onto an island. 
Uh, we have one focused on policy at all levels, but also research that informs those policies, right? And thinking about both at the local, the state, the national, the global levels, how do we have uh, policies that align? Um, because, you know, climate doesn't stop at city boundaries. Um, and then finally, a lab that focuses and an innovation lab that focuses on partnership, deep partnership and collaboration cross sector. Um, that's a lot of different flavors. Um, okay, okay, we're gonna get closer to this. I'm gonna ask you all the question that I hear the most whenever I speak with folks who do innovation work, partnership work. Um, okay, how? So you gave us the what, and that's nice. That's important, we, it's important for us to know the flavors of what is out there. But the big, big question is how? What's your approach? How do you do this work? What does it look like on the, de on the ground in the day to day? What values do you bring to this work that help guide the decisions that you're actually making of what's within your scope, what's not within your scope, who you're collaborating with, who you're bringing in, um, and who you're not? Um, when you're not curious. Whoever wants to go first, too. We don't have to go down the line, but if you'd like. <laughs> that worked last time. <laughs> I'm happy to start. Thank you for that question, Kim. So, how? How? Um, we are, with our early lab, actually still pre-launched. We haven't announced it yet, and we'll be doing so soon. Um, in the eight months since I joined the trust, we have been getting going on some projects that have been identified over years of engagement, both with folks that regularly are on the island, that are in the neighborhood of the island, and all across the city. Um, on the island today, we have a number of really exciting partners that we're launching a living lab with, um, and that includes the Harbor School of Every Student Public High School that is on Governor's Island with students from all five boroughs that um, take the journey I described every single morning at 7.30. Um, we have the Beam Center, which runs uh, summer camps during the summer and also trains high school students with, uh, uh, with, um, with workshop skills, machine working skills, um, to actually construct uh, commissioned art projects that are then installed across the city. Um, we have the William Oyster Project, which is headquartered on Governor's Island and which is restoring 12 um, reefs, or sorry, creating new reefs to clean up the harbor waters through a billion non-edible oysters um, in the partnership and close collaboration with communities. We also have Borough IC, which runs and manages school gardens for New York City's one million school kids, and that has its teaching garden on Governor's Island, where there are um, about a half dozen field trips every single week. And so our working lab is building off of the great work of these organizations on Governor's Island, and we will actually also be launching a couple of new programs. One, an expanded field trip opportunity to stitch together some of those experiences that I described, and also hopefully to offer the Hubbard School students yet another internship opportunity on the island. Um, secondly, we're also using this place, which is dedicated to the education, inspiration, and enjoyment of all New Yorkers, as a piloting demonstration site for climate solutions in the built environment and in the future also events and convenings. Through all of this, our guiding philosophy is to do this in dialogue with communities. Although we're an island, we're never working in a silo. And that's an ethos that I bring from having spent nearly a decade working with many folks, including Joe, um, on um, new programs and initiatives. Um, and one last thing that I would say, too, in the ethos of you know, experimentation and trying things out and acknowledging that mistakes are OK and failure doesn't mean that it was a waste of time, that we are starting small and learning by doing. So, um, you know, there are two parts to the Center for Climate Solutions. One is a very exciting, you know, after a multi-year solicitation, we'll be partnering with Stony Brook University as the anchor institution to build a new climate campus on Governor's Island. Um, in its first phase, that will include 400,000 square feet of, of facilities, you know, classrooms, dormitories, um, convening spaces that are also available to the public and to organizations, um, as well as four and a half uh, acres of new open space. 
So that has been a long, multi-year effort. And then the Living Lab is the second track of the work that will be announced and launching soon. And for that one, we're starting small, learning by doing, and really excited to see what this will be. Um, and congratulations on this announcement. Um, Kim, you asked a lot of good questions, so I'm going to try and dig into the, almost all of them. Um, but to be honest, the how is something that we're still working on. We're a young organization. We were founded in 2019, and as the, one of the founding staff members, I just joined in 2021. So we're still, you know, very much in startup mode and figuring things out. But um, zooming out a little bit, um, we were really founded um, in order to address what um, our founder Ayana calls the big blue gap in the Green New Deal. So focusing very much on ocean um, climate solutions um, and creating more comprehensive ocean climate policy for cities, as I mentioned. Um, and using that as our sort of guardrail has been really helpful in thinking about how are we approaching our work. Um, the next step is, of course, partnerships um, and creating what we call communities of practice. So here is a community of practice. Um, these are the four folks who we're learning from and working with on implementation. Um, and so we have the research that we do internally, the community wisdom that informs the types of policy solutions, the analysis and the research that we're doing. Um, and then we have the partners that we work with to take our policy and put it out into the world and understand what that looks like in implementation. Um, and now applying my sort of design research lens to this, we don't just do this in a vacuum and we don't just create policy and then set it free. We are constantly iterating and this is what we think of when we're talking about prototyping policy. We start by learning from um, the folks who um, are working on the types of solutions that we to see in cities. We're learning from community knowledge, um, community expertise, and that limited expertise. We're taking that and combining it with our own research and developing what we um, believe are the most comprehensive solutions. Um, and then we're identifying the people that will work on implementation. And then we're taking that, learning from that, learning from that implementation, and coming back to the drawing board and beginning again. So that's very much the how, that's sort of what we're thinking about will be the sort of next steps for how we are um, contributing to um, creating more climate-ready coastal cities. Um, and yeah, bringing together the folks working on uh, climate readiness is, is critical to what we're doing. Uh, one of our core goals is really to get research results into the hands of everybody in this room. That's what we want to do. I've uh, you know, been a practitioner and I've been applying for FEMA grants where I was trying to convince them that nature-based approaches are a great idea and was looking for uh, reports that would help support that and, and struggled to find them at times. And so the Stone Living Lab in, in approaching the how, that's, you know, we, we start with what our, our core goals are and kind of work backwards on um, the uh, how. And, and so, you know, we have a, a sort of five core pillars that, that work towards that. Right? We have our research monitoring we have our education work, we have our engagement work, uh, policy work, as well as the climate preparedness work. Um, climate preparedness we look at as sort of coalition building and, and the, the social resilience, what, what we're experiencing here today, like right? you know, helping people connect. And all of those need to work in conjunction with one another. Um, you know, we're we're young as well. We're, we're only three years old and, and we're going from having you know, uh, a really impressive range of research activities that have been going on for the past uh, three years to, to this coming year, focusing in on three core research projects that Kathy Stone mentioned earlier. You know, uh, one is the, the Seawalls project that, that she mentioned, another looking at Carl Burns, and a third the, the partnership with the city of Boston. So on the how, it's making sure that all of those different uh, aspects of the work are connected and that we're keeping the goals in mind and that we're really, you know, trying to make sure we're focusing on, on what those needs are in the most urgent way possible. Okay, if I'm gonna synthesize, what I'm hearing is there's some P 
pieces of the secret sauce that you all are dipping into, um, even though you have different whats a little bit. So one thing I heard is about starting small, especially when you're a small scale yourself and when you're new, thinking about how to try a thing um, and thinking about, oh, it might not work, but we started small, so that's kind of okay. We tried it. We learned. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is related to that, which is iteration, right? And understanding, like, we tried a thing small. Maybe we'll try it again, but maybe we'll do it a little bit better this time. Maybe we'll take some pieces out of this, add some pieces, tweak some pieces. Okay, cool. And then the last thing that I heard is there's a set of shared goals and values that actually form the foundation of the work that you do. And those end up being kind of your guide stars, your navigation pieces when there is a question of, well, how do we iterate next? Is that, am I getting that right? Yeah, okay. One last question from me, and then I will be quiet and let all of you ask your questions. Um, but it's really like, okay, we talked about the what, we talked about the how in your individual spaces. Um, it indicates to me that there may be room for other similar types of labs in these spaces. So I'm curious just how you see one another in this climate space and like what does that mean for all of you? Like do you work as an individual lab in your own space or are you thinking about collaborating with one another? Like what does that look like? <laughs> so, yeah, how does collaboration look and work with each other? You know, when we were, of course, you know, having conversations preparing for this panel, my overriding takeaway was that we were all excited about it. And, um, you know, we've known each other for a long time, Joe, and I think we have always seen collaboration as kind of the fulcrum and the launch pad for the new things that help make the world a better place. And, I, I would say, I would say to be honest, at this point, we don't know how we'll collaborate yet, but we think keeping that door open is really important, and so that's why you know, so we're having this conversation as a starting point. Again, starting small and learning by doing. I think it's also, in a practical way, tracking opportunities to collaborate. Um, so, as one, you know, concrete example, um, the piloting and demonstration program that we are um, creating will include both an open call and an annual challenge. Is there a um, potential opportunity for us to design a call for coastal um, shoreline treatments or coastal adaptation solutions that we can pilot um, learning from the, uh, the, cobble, the cobble burns and the other solutions that we're doing here? And so I see all of this as intersecting and generative. I should also mention, too, that of course New York City is a big place, eight and a half million people, um, many, many more workers, and we are launching Government Island Swimming Lab into an incredibly rich ecosystem of innovation labs there that include those focused on climate tech, that include those that are focused on social innovation and many other types. And so, you know, all of this, I think, you know, it's one of those things where really people say about the pie, but like, we're expanding the pie here. Um, and it's about collaboration, not competition, it's about finding ways to partner and just keep an eye out um, the intention and setting that up front, I think that was a lot. Yeah, um, when I think about what our role in this ecosystem is as a policy think tank, um, we need to hear from you know, Joe and Lauren and your respective organizations about what the problems are. Um, what are you dealing with on the ground? Because we then can work on developing the enabling policy frameworks and solutions to help, um, you know, solve for those problems. But collaboration is key to that. We need to hear from everyone to better understand how are we, where should we be focusing our efforts? We don't want to create policy that is then not used and not implemented and um, not doable. So we need to take in that information through collaboration um, to then develop our work. And um, one of our key projects for the upcoming year is developing what we're calling a Blue New Deal for Coastal Cities. So it's a high-level policy framework with model policies and best practices 
Um, and once we release that, we'll also be working on a few specific cities on implementation. So we have to constantly be thinking, what does implementation look like? Who are our audiences? And that looks different depending on where you are. So we're not doing race-based work, but we need to hear from the people on the ground to make sure that whatever we're developing can be then replicated in an appropriate manner where you are. So um, to us, that's where collaboration comes in, is thinking about what are the problems that need solving for. We've heard a lot in the last day, especially in the breakout sessions. And it's a lot of proof of out when we're thinking about, hey, where should we be focusing our work on nature-based solutions when we're developing a, you know, a belief deal? You know, Laura, Laura and I have both started on our respective roles around, around the internet and on still fairly recently. Um, you know, when we did, we connected and, and realized the similarities and, and, you know, Lauren connected me with uh, Shifo and her colleague Lara. And, you know, we all agreed what, what a disservice it would be to the field and to everyone in this room if there were, you know, a couple of climate labs uh, a, a couple of hundred miles apart that were all doing the same work, replicating each other's work and competing for the same grants, right? So we, we figured it's, it's really important to be complementing each other's work and figuring out how we can collaborate and be of best service to everyone in this room and, and to the field. And so, you know, all the panels that, you know, we've been attending the past couple of days are helping inform that work and, and helping inform how we do collaborate. It is an iterative process. So uh, I think we're really excited about seeing where that goes. And, and there, there is room for more. I, I agree with you. I was on a, a call on Monday night about the uh, Central Park Climate Lab, which is, is pretty new, which I, I just heard about this doing adjacent but also similar work and it seems very complimentary and we should probably get on the phone with them within a couple of weeks. Um, but we just want to make sure that the, the work that is actually going on through the practitioners in this room is informing the research, is informing the education engagement work, informing the equity work that we're doing and the policy work so that we can end up churning out you know, meaningful complimentary work to the field. I feel like you all are like major connectors and doers and like just get stuff doneers. Um, so this is exciting. I mean, I think that this is fun. I'm going to open it up now. Enough questions from me. How about all of you? Anybody have a question out there? Can I question Can I my back off of Oh, yeah, absolutely. Think yeah. about your questions. <laughs> um, thanks for that. I just wanted to piggyback off of Joe to say that at the end of the day, and you know, I, I maybe this is. Maybe this isn't the best way to put it, but I truly feel like it's not about us, it's not about the lab, and it's about the communities and the people that we're serving, especially the frontline communities that are dealing with climate impacts on a day-to-day -day basis. I know that you know a big focus here is urban coastal flooding, and that's a big issue in New York City too. We have 520 miles of coastline, but then in 2021 we had Ida, the remnants of Ida, you know, flooded the inland parts of the city, and the new administration has um, put a real dedicated focus on dealing with that issue. And in extreme heat, every summer, 300 New Yorkers end up in the hospital on over 90 degree days. And we had more of those last August than anywhere else. And so at the end of the day, it's not about us and the labs and the lab success. It's about making sure that we are providing platforms for people that are experiencing those frontline impacts to speak for themselves and um, really uplifting the work that they're doing in their communities, trying to convene that, um, shine a light on it, and then bring um, solutions back into the neighborhoods where people live and work and learn. Cool. Yes, good point. I feel like, uh, I feel like you're saying that your labs are a way in for folks. Um, right, so if you don't know where you fit, if you don't have your connections, if you're looking for new ones, maybe this is one place where you can start. Um, and that's top down, but it's also very bottom up, which is awesome. Cool. All right, questions from the Ooh, hands up. My question is to Shatila. You mentioned that your policy work was kind of winding up and you'd be finishing up and selecting a couple of cities to focus on. I was wondering what those cities were and how, what was the criteria for selecting those cities? Thank you. Um, our policy work is never finished. <laughs> 
But we are actually, we haven't selected cities. Um, we are still figuring out who they're going to be. And a lot of that is, um, we won't be selecting cities. It's going to be understanding who the cities are and, and what they need um, and taking their feedback and um, seeing how we can sort of strengthen the policy solutions in a Blue New Deal. So we want cities to come to us. We want to be able to convene leaders from cities, leaders from communities in those cities um, and other practitioners and from there figure out, okay, well, where are our efforts best focused? But it's very much going to be, you know, coming back to collaboration. Um, it won't just be on us. We want to be taking in all of that and then seeing um, who's either, who will find this most useful and going from there. So uh, I was really interested in your saying that it's a way in and the way out. One of the big emphases that we have in the new funding is on capacity building. And I think that's a little bit condescending because there is capacity that needs to be tapped into. So I'm wondering whether there's an intermediate step there between coming in and then taking what you've learned and then building your own institutions where they need to happen. So I'm wondering if that's something that you're working on. Okay. Well, I, I, I think that's kind of, yeah, uh, I agree. It's part of what we're saying. We're, we're all in iterative stages as the organization's growing. And, and events like this help inform the directions that they're going. And we want to figure out what those pain points are and work with uh, people like yourself to actually figure out what the most useful research monitoring work as well as education, engagement, and policy work actually is. <laughs> um, I can also yeah. add on to that. Um, thank you. So, sorry, I was going to respond briefly to that too, to say that I, I feel like um, there's this kind of um, you know, sense that we're embarking on something new here with climate adaptation or with resilience and so on. Um, but maybe that step between is something that's been there all along, which is, again, just keeping the door open and having conversations with people, building relationships over time with patients and with care and attention. Um, and so I think that um, brings us back to, you know, the role of government whose mission is to keep that door open, um, comes down to the role of um, uniquely positioned nonprofits like the ones where, where we work, and then also community-based organizations. I mean, although the grant funding is new, they're really tapping into, right, um, the strongest of the relationships that are there. And so I feel like sort of thinking about it that way rather than something that's new is we're bringing new resources onto old problems, onto um, the strongest of the relationships that are there. Um, thank you for your uh, panel discussion. It's really inspiring. Um, I know this conference has several students, uh, participants, um, from different levels, and I guess I would ask what your words of wisdom to these student leaders, instead of being depressed or sad about climate, how do you inspire them to be hopeful and to enter this field um, in, in enabling access or in an equitable way? <laughs> Go ahead. I, can, I can start. Um, I think about something that our founder Ayana says a lot, and it's what if we get it right? Um, and that type of visioning, and we don't use the word hope, but it's what if we get it right? And that type of visioning is really important because it helps us not just remain solutions oriented, but also think about a world in which we have adapted, we have um, created resilience. Um, and we have built social cohesion. Um, so that's how we sort of, that's how I would suggest and that's how I keep my work going is thinking about that framing of we, we do have time, we do have space, and we can get this right, and the work we're doing now will help inform that. Yeah, that, that's uh, great points. And that we try to take that same approach. I mean, there's a lot of doom and gloom, climate coverage out there, right? We see it every day. Um, uh, 
but you know, what if we what if we do get it right? I mean, that panel yesterday again, I know I mentioned it twice, is because it just really resonated. Uh, you know, and, and I, I fell asleep thinking about it last night, where you know, making sure we're doing that observation, being mindful of you know indigenous knowledge, making sure we're being thoughtful about uh, making sure that everybody's at the table, and and there's no more important places to be doing that than with with youth and. and Starting all the way at the youngest levels. I mean, our you know uh, teacher institute is going to be happening this summer. Um, you know, that our education manager Rebecca Shore leaves is you know has ten public school teachers that from throughout Greater Boston um, where they're learning about climate adaptation and, and uh, bringing those lessons back into the classroom and helping build a, a pipeline, hopefully, of enthusiasm and optimism uh, because. Uh, Youth are struggling with with climate right now, you know. Um, so I think it's making sure that we're doing the things that we're, we're trying to do on a regular basis with engagement in really meaningful ways and avoiding that sort of doing little pessimism. I'm going to lean on three of my favorite quotes to answer this question, and they have to do with learning history um, and understanding it. Um, they have to do with, okay, I forget the second one. Let me start with that one. The first one is an essay by Marie Inez Aguilar, who is a black woman from the South, um, who wrote an essay, Climate Being the First Existential Threat. And what she says is, as a black woman and descendant of slaves, that you know, this is not the first time that my people have experienced um, the threat of the collapse of their society. Um, and tells the story specifically of her family and how they arrived at this place. And so, so she acknowledges that while climate change is the first, maybe the first time that there is this global existential threat, that there is a lot to build from and learn from there. The second thing is, um, something we were talking about this morning, is exuberance. So uh, this quote is from Annie Alvarez, who's husband, Joseph Albers, the color peers, um, together they fled Nazi Germany in the 1940s. And she says, we investigate and worry and analyze and we forget that the new comes about through exuberance and not through a defined deficiency. And so staying joyful and leaning into those things that ground you, um, that make you smile, that you come together with friends and family for, I think is really important. Because that's what we're fighting for, right? Um, and then the last thing is just to keep walking. Um, this is, I think, Eduardo Galeano said, the point of utopia, what is the point of utopia, is just to keep walking. And I think that speaks to persistence, and you know, although it's important to rest, um, looking ahead. Thank you all for your work today and also your work long term. And I have maybe a, a request and a hope is a lot of our climate work stops at 27 because I think that's where our infrastructure starts to fail. Uh, um, I know it's uncertainty, but it's also that like we're built for the coastline not to move. And you know, at that point it's kind of hard to, to manage. Um, I would love for you great thinkers to think about what comes next when we shift from shoring up what's now to, to building a new and what should be and what could be more equitable, what could be more beautiful, um, what would give us hope. Because I think we spend a lot of time thinking about shoring up and that's, that's not forever. Um, so if, if, if not the climate labs, I'm not sure who's going to be thinking tangibly, but also further out. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. You and I have had you know, many conversations about that exact topic, and it's, um, that's one of the reasons we're all here together today, is to, to try to envision and imagine And yeah, 2070, I think, <laughs> is like this milestone that we're, we're all always focused on, but it's kind of an arbitrary year, right? And, and we need to be thinking, you know, far beyond it and, and thinking about ways that we can, um, you know, do this work in really meaningful ways in the long, long in the future. Is this is time for fiction. Has anyone read any good sci-fi recently? <laughs> I mean, you know.
Sophia's, I think that um, those are important reframes and truly free spaces to imagine. And maybe, you know, you know, I've also spent hours stressing over the sewer systems and uh, the physical infrastructure that truly has ossified where we live and how we live in concrete and steel. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there isn't, isn't, I don't know, I think the best answer I have is fiction, <laughs> imagination, and all of that. And I think just the last thing I'll say about that is thinking again about what if we get it right, it's also thinking about us as a part of nature, coming back to the use of these natural infrastructure solutions and nature-based infrastructures. Um, we are not separate from nature. Living in cities, we also we probably feel that way all the time, surrounded by concrete and CSOs and thinking about all that. But if I think about using that visioning exercise beyond 2070, um, we are fully integrated in nature. Um, we are not just living alongside it. Um, it is part of us. So that's what I think about. Thank you all. I think um, many of us either come from nonprofits or represent groups where within the reality of our operations is that although we love collaborating, we are, there's a limited amount of resources that many of us end up head to head against of competing for grants and resources. And I'm curious if you all see a role with your organizations to push back a little bit on the folks who are providing funding or providing grants and saying we also need to reframe how we distribute those resources. And we shouldn't live in a world where two organizations have, you know, who's going to win out of getting the funding. I think we'll also many of us are familiar with, you know, having to cater our projects to chase the interests of those funders. So I'm curious if you see a role in that level of innovation. Of, can we create a new world where we're, you know, trust the folks who are receiving the funding to do the right thing? You guys go into the study now, this is exactly what <laughs> Rebecca and I were talking about earlier. Um, and something that we come across internally is um, how are we aligning our work with what people are funding? And do we develop our work to then, yeah, chase funding? Or do we develop the work that we know is correct and find the people who want to fund it? And we can't do the work without the funding. So this is just a constant battle that I'm dealing with. Um, but yeah, I think that um, as I um, sending out grant proposals as I am, you know, developing LOIs and just getting caught up in this massive matrix that I didn't even realize existed before joining this organization. Um, I'm thinking a lot about where power sits and the power imbalances, especially in terms of small organizations and not just us, I'm thinking about community organizations, community leaders and funds that they need. But what gives me hope is that a lot of small funders, a lot of uh, uh, family foundations, and I was just, you know, with a friend last night who is uh, running a new foundation. They are taking that into consideration, and they're saying, we want to make this as easy as possible for you. We have the funds. Tell us what you need, and we will distribute it in a way that works best. And ongoing, we want to be there not just as a silent donor, but as someone who can be connecting, who can be getting your information and the work that you're doing out in the world, so helping you grow beyond just, you know, the dollar signs. Um, so that's what gives me hope in all of this work, is that it's starting with the small organizations who are seeing all this. I, I, I know collaboration is something in the morning, but uh, it's so important for funders as well. And we're fortunate to have a funder who works hand in hand with us to do that iteration and figure out, you know, exactly what is needed and pivot and adjust and, and really, um, you know, help us shape and form a lab that is responding to both local, regional, and, and, and global needs. So I, I think that, you know, uh, we feel very thankful to be able to do that work in collaboration with each other. And then I think we're going to get to a point where we can start really identifying what those needs are and, and pursue another funding to achieve it. But, but you're right, you're right. We need to be proactive about it. And it's really important to be able to make sure that the mission and vision is driving the, the funding, not the other way around, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I would just echo both of you to say that it feels like this almost impossible multi-dimensional Venn diagram that you're always balancing between um, all of these things. And I think um, I've seen some exciting grants come out that, you know, there isn't a 
emphasis on reducing um, the burden on the grantee. There is a real intention and outreach that's happening to try and reach um, you know, certain organizations. Um, you know, I think it's all a work in progress. Yeah. I'm just gonna add moderator discretion um, that uh, in a former life, I led a, non a national nonprofit organization called Metro Lab Network. And speaking of partnership, collaboration, and innovation, one of the things that my former organization did and still does is work with the National Science Foundation. So small-scale funders, absolutely, um, because I think that when we think about small-scale pilots and local innovation and things that are tailored locally, these groups are very important in making sure that those things get funded and that they happen. But large scale, the National Science Foundation has a funding line item called the Civic Innovation Challenge. And maybe some of you have heard it. If any of you he are here from Eastie Farms, um, those folks are current grantees. Um, and it's a challenge that's $50,000 planning grant, a million dollars for a 12 month deployment locally. And the requirement is that an academic partner who is the, the grant recipient must do a community-led project. It has to have a co-PI where there is community in the lead, uh, named in, as part of the proposal and at the forefront, not just a letter of support. Um, and so there are small, I would say, movements toward making this a large-scale funder priority to think about um, that, and, and for two rounds now, we've had 52 national uh, folks in cohort one and 56 in the current cohort, and FYI, we will probably have a third cohort coming online soon, so if you get on the email list, you'll know when the, um, when the solicitation comes out, if that's of interest to anybody here. And maybe one last question. Yeah, I just, want, I just want a quick comment is uh, some scientists have still on that and we can't do this without collaboration. I'm totally I'm on board with that. But well-meaning competition can be a good thing, right? I mean, that's how science works. We want to, us, us, friendly pushing each other is good. No one can understand what's going on. Quick example is that as we, the last couple of years, we've been working on a new method that the stone lab to do to, to collect data in urban settings where you can't fly your drone or this solar or there's other reasons why you can't fly your drone. And I specifically, you know, from our group, we published it and went to a conference that's really well thought of. And I gave the presentation. I walked out. A friend of mine, a colleague from the state of Washington, said, I thought of this idea two weeks ago. Right? And we had been doing it for the last six months. And now we're going to partner. He has a grad student. He's at the University of Washington, worked for the state. I'm going to have a grad student. So this summer, he's coming here, and we're going to do it together. Even though there was a healthy competition, and we got there a little, literally a little earlier than he did, but now we're working together. So that competition should be a really good thing if it's done right away. And that's why I'm glad we're all here and we do want to collaborate, but there can be, we can have a little fun too. I think that's right. Cool. Yeah. Everyone else in agreement? I guess I'm the lucky one to ask the last question. Mm -hmm. um, many questions have to talk about uh, finding the resources and grants before. I'm just wondering, uh, in, I'm a grad student, and uh, most of the uh, uh, classes in grad school and undergrads, we actually are crying for uh, little projects that students can work on. And actually, we've led uh, field campaigns for the past six to 10 years, and we generate data. Is there um, examples or thoughts about you know, citizen sciences in your work? And, you know, potentially also uh, expanding the resources and also facilitating uh, collaborations. And, and, uh, Melanie and Rebecca would be able to speak to this much better than I, but I mean, citizen science is, is, is core, and community science is core of the work that we're doing. And, and we're fortunate that all of our researchers, including Mark right behind you, were you know, uh, affiliated with UMass Boston here. So hopefully we're building that pipeline of, of, of students to be engaged in the work in, in really meaningful ways. And not just from UMass Boston, from, from hopefully many uh, local 
universities as well. But yeah, I, I think that's absolutely essential to the work. Yeah, and if I can make a plug for another project we're working on, um, in conjunction with the New Deal for Developing and Ocean Climate Policy Resource Hub, it's going to be open access, it's digital, um, and it really sort of funnels the breadth of information into one easy to access digital space that is free and open to the public. And citizen science, local knowledge is key to that. Um, so we're developing that over the next few months, but we'll absolutely be thinking about um, collecting all this on the ground information and knowledge and then figuring out how to integrate that into the hub and also thinking about the visualization aspect. How can we make sure that it's accessible and um, easy to digest and understand? But yes, it plays a huge role. So I'll speak both to my past life and current one. Um, the mayor's office has partnered in the past with other organizations uh, on uh, community science, including with the Sea Grant, I met someone here from the Sea Grant, um, on a, uh, a sunny day flooding uh, project, uh, Flood Watch, um, focused on Jamaica Bay, New York City, where residents were trained to track sunny day flooding and record data, take photos that went into a public map and database. Now, after a couple of years of doing that, the residents asked the question naturally, so what, what now? What's going to happen? We're, we're tired of taking photos <laughs> of this flooding of text. And so, you know, that project continues to evolve. One of the um, additional projects that came up, you know, you could um, put a loose relationship, is FloodNet as well. And so FloodNet came out of NYU and other local universities partnering with the mayor's office, and that led to a city um, funded commitment to deploy 500 of these flood sensors developed for that research effort all across New York City in conversation directly with communities. Um, those are two examples of projects in New York City that um, you know began at universities in partnership with government and now um, you know have a physical and social footprint. Um, on Governors Island, we are really thrilled uh, to partner with Stony Brook University to create this climate campus, and we think that this is just the beginning of uh, decades of, of work on of, um, what you described. So, you know, nothing today, but, but coming soon. Um, Stony Brook uh, has uh, convened 10 other institutions and is itself a state university. Um, the City University of New York is another partner. And thinking of community science, you know, with these universities, many of which those students come from, um, the city and the state is very exciting for us to lean into because, you know, if you're working with the native New Yorker, really all the science that they're doing is, is community-based, is citizen science, or sorry, not citizen, community science. It's a lot to digest. Um, I before I wrap this panel. I would like to offer to all of the three of you any last thoughts, anything that you wish you said or that you didn't like, oh, I would, we moved on to the next question, um, or just anything else. You've got a platform. Um, last words. Not last words, but parting words. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you again to, to everyone who's joined us at the conference. Just absolutely thrilled to see so many uh, familiar and new faces here. And I, I love the uh, challenges to, to make new connections um, and think and reflect upon um, you know those who have helped inform our, our own paths and continue to. So so thank you all for for being here. Um, thank you, Joe, Melanie, and everyone else uh, who works uh, with the lab for inviting us such a key part of what we do. And I said this probably a million times while I was talking, but like we need to hear from you to help inform the work. Um, we need to hear what the problems are so that we can develop the policy to then help um, address those issues. So please, just come to us and, and let's talk. Thanks for having us. Thanks for leading such a great panel. Um, and come and talk to us. <laughs> We're just getting started. Like I said, you know, kind of getting a sneak preview here. We haven't launched our living lab yet, but we are, um, you know, starting small, talking to everyone, um, doing lots of tours of Governor's Island. So if you're ever in New York City, please reach out, and I'm happy to take you for a walk. Um, and I wouldn't be doing my own job if I didn't say, I want to invite all of you to, uh, if, especially if you're here tomorrow, 
uh, to the Boston Area Research Initiative Conference that will happen at MIT, at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, we have a panel in the morning focused, I know it's not coastal resilience, but on environmental justice, which is a huge piece of this, um, as well as a panel focused on co-design of green spaces. Um, and so, if any of you want to widen your connections and further your connections, the Bari Conference is free. Um, and we definitely welcome late registrants, so <laughs> come on down, walk on in, MIT Media Lab. Uh, at the MIT campus in Cambridge tomorrow, all day long, free lunch. It's, it'll be fun. Um, also, coffee, snacks, people. Um, as I wrap this, what I'd like for all of you to do again, right, and I'm going to invite all of you to participate in helping me close this out, is to return back to that big accomplishment, that thing that you are so proud of. And those people that you've brought along with you through this conversation, through that journey, through this point in the day today. All of you as well. And now I want you to hold the feeling of feeling the pride, the joy, the exuberance of accomplishing something. How will you set each other up for success? What will your role be in helping someone else feel that feeling? I invite you to think about that, to do that as we move forward today um, and as we move out of this conference space and back into our real world lives. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe, Lauren, Chantal, and Kim for that awesome conversation. With a challenge as vast as climate change, it is critical we find ways to collaborate and share what we've learned. Hearing about these three organizations that are leading by example is inspiring and rejuvenating. Before I release you all for lunch, here's, I have a quick review of this afternoon's run-up show, as well as some other reminders. Although we were just thinking about the moments we were most proud of just now, I want to remind folks that this evening, we have an event where perhaps we can share and collaborate and commiserate about some of those moments we might not be as proud of. So we have our event in Dorchester Brewing tonight, our Blunders and Bloopers event. There's going to be a QR code up on the screen to find out a little more and to make sure you're on the shuttle this evening. Um, for example, have you ever been given, been, been giving a program and had a box turtle? Take a, leave you a small present in your hand as you're presenting to them and have to just sort of deal with that. Other stories like that will be more tonight. So we're about to release you all for lunch. You have until about 12.50 to take a walk, stretch your legs, get outside. The sun is out today. Please enjoy the spectacular view that you'll have um, of the harbor behind us soon. Our first breakout sessions are going to be from 1 to 2.30. Uh, the three sessions for everyone who um, are, is joining us this afternoon are Sustainable Waterfront Access and Flood Resilience here in the ballroom, Societal Co-Benefits of Nature-Based Approaches in the breakout room two doors down, and What Works, Frameworks, Tools, and Lessons Learned Part 2, just next door. So please feel free to join all of those. We'll have a short break, and then we'll have our second set of breakouts from 2.45 to 4.15. In the meantime, enjoy lunch.